Inshallah, today I'll give you an overview of the story that's coming for coming ahead in uh, Surat Al-Kahf, which is the story of Musa and Khidr, alayhi uh, salam. And the the person of Khidr is not mentioned by name in the Quran. That's the opinion of most Mufassirun. It's a mysterious figure. Uh, there have been some interesting interesting stories made up about Khidr, alayhi salam, in Islamic history. Um, some pretty cute ones, like this guy who just went to a town and he didn't know anybody there and he just decided to spend the night in the masjid and they had uh, kicked everybody out of the masjid and they asked him to leave too uh, and he said, okay, I'm leaving in a minute but he didn't realize and he passed out and he woke up and he's the only one inside the masjid and this guy brought him fresh, fru- fresh food and he's like, aren't you supposed, nobody's supposed to be here right now and he goes, yes, you're right but I came here to take care of you and he just gives him food and he disappears in a poof and فَعَلِمْتُ أَنَّهُ خِذْرَ عَلَيْهِ salam. So I knew that was Khidr. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, cool. So the, what I want to share with you first is the beautiful placement of the story from, uh, from an Imani perspective, from a Hikmatul Qur'an perspective, wisdom of Qur'an perspective. Uh, we went through an entire passage, or actually two passages that mirrored each other, right? One with an opening statement, one with a closing statement. And in those two passages, the point that's been reinforced over and over again is Allah has a plan for everything. Down to Allah has a plan for every plant, uh, all the way to every, Allah has a plan for every nation, right? And in between, all human beings that live this life, when they stand before Allah, they're going to know that every little thing and big thing was accounted for. Nothing went unnoticed by Allah. Allah's justice is completely perfect and absolute, right? So Allah's planning and His justice and His knowledge has been established in a very thorough way in the two passages that we went through just now. But the problem for most human beings that have a, a, a faith problem is actually a problem of questioning why things happen in life. That's really where the problem lies. Why is bad stuff happening to me or anyone else in this world? As a matter of fact, the number one argument that any typical, some, someone towards it that has atheistic tendencies or just aggression towards God in general, uh, the first things they're going to talk about is either their personal problems or problems in the world. If there is a God, how come this, this, and this happens? How come this, this bad stuff happens? And there's a list of bad stuff, right? So that is certainly a, a, you know, a, a big problem to deal with. Now the way Allah deals with it in this surah is very beautiful. First of all, if you notice, the previous pa- uh, passage, or the two passages, were all about, first of all, briefly about Allah's planning in this world, but really primarily highlighting what is going to last, and what is the perfect justice of Allah in the Akhirah. This world is not about perfect, perfect justice, the next world is, right? And yet Allah Azza wa is going to bring everything back in order, everything is going to be balanced out. But you have to believe in the unseen for that. You can't just believe in the seen world, you have to believe in the unseen. I would even argue from whatever I've been able to understand, even in the Fatiha, uh, it's actually Allah's perfection, is, a, is a part of Allah's perfection is actually in the creation of an afterlife. That's a, nece- that's a necessary corollary of the perfection of Allah of his absolute justice. Because without the afterlife, you have a person in this world who commits a hundred murders. Right? And what do you, how do they compensate it? You can, the most you're going to do is kill them once. They can't pay for a hundred lives. And it could just be that those hundred lives were dependents on other people. So they didn't just affect a hundred lives, they affected a hundred families, maybe a hundred communities. There's no way this one person can pay damages in this world for what they may have done to a hundred people. That's impossible. Forget a hundred, not even two people. Maybe not even one person. Even if you take an eye for an eye, that may not still be perfect justice. Right? This guy is a loner. Nobody depends on him. Nobody knows him. And the one he killed is the head of a household or a mother of children or whatever. He ruined several lives. The damage is far, has far more repercussions. So the idea of getting absolute justice in this life is, is actually, a, it's, it's not possible. It is impossible. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah would even go as far as to say if, you, if somebody slapped you and you slapped them back, how do you know your slap didn't hurt them more? So when he talked about the, the one being muqtasid, the one, you know, because Allah says, minhum walimun nafsi wa minhum, man, uh, uh, minhum muqtasid, the one who's fair, absolutely fair. He said even absolute fairness technically can't exist. You could try your best, but how do you know you're not crossing a line? How do you know your punch wasn't harder than the punch that was thrown at you? Kind of thing, you know? So the safer route for you is to forgive. That's what he would argue. But look, what does the afterlife do? Every debit is credited. Every credit is debited. Like anything somebody got away with, 
they didn't get away with it. Allah recorded it. لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا أحصاها. There's no way out. There's, it's all going to be paid for. And if you don't believe that, then it's going to be hard to believe in a God that's fair. When you only have this life. When that's all there is. You know, and we, subhanAllah, in, in, our, in our faith, we have this reliance on Allah's mercy and a reliance on Allah's justice, a dependence on Allah's justice. Like, for ourselves, we're, we're hoping for Allah's mercy. But when we see crime in the world, and we see injustice in the world, we actually lean on Allah's justice. Like, these people won't get away with what they did. And that's why Allah gives that as a consolation in the Qur'an. أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَشْتَرَحُ السَّيِّئَاتِ or أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَ Did people think that ones that have done crimes against us or committed evil deeds, that they got ahead of us? That they got away? سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ What a horrible decision they made. This was actually sent, said to the Muslims when they were being tortured. And the, the cry comes, how can they get away with what they're doing to us? In Mecca, how could they get away with that? And then those ayat came, you think they just got away with it? No, 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 they didn't get away with it. They're not paying for it now, doesn't mean they're not gonna pay for it, right? That's the, just the, uh, Allah's perfect justice is directly associated in the Quran with Allah Azza wa Jal's creation of the Akhirah, the, the afterlife. And so I wanted to highlight first that point because the last two passages that I ran through with you were just about that, just establishing that concept that the justice of Allah is perfect. But, that is the Akhirah, it's the unseen And it's like there's a curtain Between us and the unseen Like all we can see is this world We don't see the unseen We don't see the Akhirah, we don't see the angels We don't see the behind the scenes source code Of Allah's design, Allah's plans, right? What's gonna happen in this story Is basically for a few instances Allah is going to lift the curtain a little bit And you can get a peek at what's going on behind the scenes so something's going to look really bad, you know, like if you know the story of Musa and Khidr, he goes on a journey to learn, which we'll talk about in some depth. But when he goes on this journey to learn, alayhi salam, he's, the first thing he's told is, look, the lessons I want to teach you, you don't have patience to deal with. You just don't have the patience. That's the first assessment of his teacher, by the way, that your barrier to learning is your impatience. That's his first, uh, you know, uh, assessment. By the way, uh, sabr isn't just patience, it's also not being able to remain consistent. So for a student, the, one of the biggest dangers, even if there's a student as great as Musa alayhi salam, the danger is not being able to be consistent. And also not being patient. Those two things together, right? So if that's a danger for him, that's certainly a danger for you and me. And our, our barriers to learning. Anyway, so he says, you're not going to be able to be patient with me. Now, why is he not being... Patient, because he sees things he can't tolerate. He sees basically, in two cases, injustices and in the towards others. And in the third case, injustice towards himself. Right, in two cases, it's either, you know, this ship that's being wrecked or a child that's been killed. And in the third case, he did all this work and he didn't get compensated. We could have just gotten paid at least, we're starving, right? On a side note, by the way, part of the beautiful perfection of the surah and the, 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 the symmetry of the story is that it began uh, with him being hungry and asking, uh, where's the fish? We gotta eat. And, the, and that's where trouble began. That's when his student got in trouble with him. Okay? And the story ends where they do hard work and they wanted to eat, right? And yastata'ama ahlaha. They wanted to eat food. And he says, we could have gotten paid. Now, why would they want to get paid? It's obvious in the ayah because they wanted to eat food. And he's like, that's it, you're expelled from this university. And he's, you know, so where it began is kind of where it ended, with, with hunger of Musa alayhi salam. You know, <laughs> that's, I thought it was adorable. But anyway. <laughs> but anyhow, in all three of these stories, then Allah lifts the curtain. And he shows a little bit of a peak of the unseen. So you don't, so you know that that justice isn't just waiting until the day of judgment. There is justice happening in this world as well. There are things that are fully going to be compensated, but in a limited sense, Allah is still executing justice every single day in this world in ways you cannot directly understand. So even the death of a child, which you might think is a horrible thing, there's more at play. Even something like a ship being damaged, there's more at play. You didn't get paid, yes, that's unfair, but there's a bigger thing at play here. There's a larger problem here, okay? Because by the way, if they did get paid, then they'd have to get paid from that money that's hidden inside the, you know, under, underground. 
which means that the, the location of those assets would be exposed to a very greedy nation. Right? So they couldn't get paid. Even though fairness would suggest that you could take some, out, some money out of there because you're the one protecting it or you're the one building that wall, they couldn't do that. Nobody else is going to pay them. Actually, they're providing the service to those two boys, not anybody else, right? Anyhow, so that's, the, that's a little bit of uh, kind of the overview of the story. Now I want to show you the organization of the story, just some things. There are a few passages in this story. Uh, the first of those passages, I'll run through the translation quickly. Don't worry about my notes. They don't make any sense to any normal human being. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ When Musa said to his young lad, Fata, Fata means young man. Uh, Fata is the same origin as the word fatwa. What does fatwa mean? What does fatwa mean? Legal verdict? Legal ruling, right? Actually, fata yaftu means to pass a judgment. And fata means when you're at the age where you're responsible for the judgments you pass, for the decisions you make. You know, when you're no longer a minor in legal sense, in the legal sense, you're, you're an adult now, you may be tried as an adult, that's when you're called a fata. That's why fata and fatwa are from the same origin. Same way when girls are uh, uh, of the age where their decision uh, is their own, which, is, which means they're ready to get married, they're called fatayat. That's when they're called fatayat, okay? Anyhow, so when Musa alayhi salam said to his fata, La abrahu, you did la mabariha, madama, marzala. What is mabariha? I don't remember. <laughs> okay, good, you don't remember either. We'll forget together. You'll remind me tomorrow, or one day. La abrahu hatta abluha majma al bahrain. I'll translate, uh, I will not abrah until I reach. You know, anyone know? Nobody remembers Abraham? I'll keep going. La <laughs> Abrahu actually means I'll keep going. Hatta abluga majma al Bahrain until I reach the 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 union place. Majma by the way, a varf, right? Mafalun wa mafilun wa mafalatun. The place of the union of the two seas, or I'll spend lifetimes going, going. So he's showing his commitment to just, I need to find this place where the two waters meet, the two bahr meet. Falama balagha, then when they finally reached it, both of it, both of them reached it, majma'a baynihima, the, the union of between the two of them, between the two seas. Nasiya hutamua, both of them forgot their fish. Ah, Allah is not saying that the young man forgot to fish. Allah is saying nasiya. Huwa nasiya huma. Nasiya, they're both responsible for forgetting the fish. And it took its it took its path. The, the, the fish took its path in the in the sea. Sarab comes from the word sarab. Sarab is a little bit different from sharab. Sharab is drink. Sarab is the image of a drink, meaning a mirage. It looked unreal. Filbahri saraba in a way that was unreal. Like it didn't is that is that really happening? I must be tired. And then you just kinda pass out. Because this half-eaten ship, or fish rather, is jumping off ship and then jet skiing down the sea. And it's leaving a wake too. You know, that's called, Sarabai is also the wake that it leaves behind. So that's what happened. I'm missing a fa. فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَا قَالَ لِفَتَاهُ آتِنَا غَدَاءَنَا When they passed by it, and they, they've already crossed, way crossed it. When they've way past crossed it. He says to his young man, his intern basically, who's also considered a prophet according to Israelite tradition, right? Atina uh, bring us our lunch. We've met with quite a bit of exhaustion uh, because of this journey of ours. Uh, interestingly, the word nasab means exhaustion. It's the most exhausting of the three status also. It's like so many kinds of nasab, right? But anyway, it's well named, you know. So we've been, we've been hit with quite a bit of exhaustion because of this journey, so this journey of ours, so let's, let's eat some fish. Uh, did you see, did you also see when we, this, so the, the student starts by saying, uh, by the way, didn't you see that too? <laughs> when we were taking some refuge near that, because you know, the, the, the ocean was getting a little turbulent, so we went towards that rock, remember? Maybe we'd get some shelter for a little while. فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ Then at that time, because things were so crazy at the time, I kind of like forgot the fish. وَمَا أَنْسَانِهُ إِلَّا شَيْطَانَ نَذْكُرَ And he notices that maybe Musa is getting upset. So he goes, no, no, no. None but shaitan made me forget. It was nothing but shaitan. It wasn't me. Shaitan got me. 
let's hate shaitan together. <laughs> like, let's, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. And Azkar, I'm mentioning it. Now that I do remember it though, he did take quite a weird way into the sea. The, the story, the back story is, I, I'm not completely convinced of the back story, but anyway, the, the story is that um, Musa alayhi salam made a statement about how knowledgeable he is on the earth. Like he, he's perhaps the most knowledgeable human being on the earth. And Allah said, there's someone who knows more than you. And you need to go learn from him. And he's, he will meet him where the two oceans meet. So he gets determined to learn now and you know, grabs this assistant and they go out to see to find this person that Allah has instructed him to meet. Okay? Yeah. Say that again? Yeah, it's Hawaii. <laughs> no, it's, it's not Hawaii. No. It's, it's closer to New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> Thank God we don't know where this place is. Thank Allah we don't know where this place is. You know what would happen if we knew where this place is? There'd be a bunch of Pakistani aunties out there looking for khidr. <laughs> and then just, you know, punk over my child or, you know, or something. Thank Allah that we don't know where this place is. Okay? There's a reason some things are kept a mystery in the Quran. Like, for example, the wall of Yajuj and Majuj. For God's sake, it's not the wall of China. Can you, can, can you just... Can, can, can. God. <coughs> we don't know, and that's okay. It's okay. And by the way, I should remind you of something that perhaps you weren't... This wasn't your year when I started Surah Al-Kahf, so I should remind you of this. The first story in this surah is the people of the cave. And the great crime committed with that story is that people asked irrelevant questions. How long did they stay? How many were they? Who cares? That's not the point. You should learn to say, Allah Rabbi, Qur Rabbi a'lamu bi iddatihim. Allah a'lamu bi malabithu. Allah knows better, Allah knows better, Allah knows better. He hammered that in in the first story. And then he tested you and me with three more stories in this surah. In all of them, you have to ask, wait, when did this happen? Who, what, where, what location? What year? Who's this young man? You're going to ask questions about Dhul Qarnayn. Same kinds of questions. You're going to ask questions about Musa and Khidr. Even the two gardeners, where are these gardens? Who are they? Are they at the time of the Prophet or before? Like Allah first taught you, here's how I want you to learn stories. Learn to not ask too many questions. By the way, in this story, the teacher is going to say what? Don't be asking too many questions. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Until I mention a little bit to you. Think about the little bit I tell you, don't worry about anything else. It's actually Allah's way of telling the story. It's not just the story itself, right? Which is why the outside, this is the background, this is where they went, did they go by land or sea? Irrelevant, yeah. Fantastic question. Excellent question. How do we draw the line between seeking knowledge, because that's what we're trying to do, and asking too many questions? You can ask as many questions as you want. Learn to ask the right questions, and you can ask as many questions as you want. The thing, the thing is not, you don't have the right to ask questions. The thing is, what is the thought process that leads you to your question? You're learning the story of Yusuf. Hey, what's the minister's wife's name? I mean, that scandalous lady, what's her name? You know? Well, so your, your question didn't arise from something Allah made you curious about. What Allah emphasizes, you ask about. What Allah de-emphasizes, you learn to de-emphasize. You see? I, Ratib al Nabul, see the way he taught this to me, even though I've taught this in the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf, I'll repeat it for you guys, because it's important for you guys. <coughs> There's the saying in Arabic, I don't know if you guys learned it, Khudh ma falak, did you learn that one? Okay, take what's in front of you. Just take what's in front of you. If you trust your teacher, then you'll focus on what he's giving you, not what he's not giving you. What happens is, Ustaz, Adam is teaching you one day a long time ago about what's a mudaf and what's a mudaf today. But are there some cases... I know you're teaching me this right now, but are there exceptions that you haven't told us about that perhaps clearly in your experience it isn't the time to discuss, but I feel that you really should because 
I have curiosities beyond what you're telling me. <laughs> so Sheikh Latif Dabusi gave this epic story, man. So good. He goes, there's this guy, he's like successful in business, right? And he's made hundreds of millions. And he decides after making all this money that he just wants to teach young people entrepreneurship. He's going to teach business. He's not going into the teaching profession because he needs the money. He just wants to do it as a benefit to young people, the next generation. So he goes to business school and teaches. By the way, if you have a professor like that, take his class. If you have a guy that's been a business professor for 30 years, as opposed to a guy that left the business world and came to be a professor, go to the guy that's left business, the business world and come and be a professor. Because they give you real world knowledge, right? non-textbook knowledge. So he goes and teaches this class, and he wants to teach students by way of example. So he says, you know, guys, if you, there's this, young, this man wants to start a business. Uh, first, he did a lot of research into his product and the location where he wants to open his retail establishment. He, he did a lot of uh, uh, research about pricing and rent versus buying. He looked at the tax strategy. He looked at the location. He looked at the kind of uh, you know, advertising and branding and the colors that he should be looking at. He looked at you know, inventory and income versus expenses, how much should be spe he spending in the first quarter, the second quarter, what were his projections for the first year. He makes this whole story up about this guy who's starting his business. And he put it in the form of a story, why? Because then students can remember it easier. If you make a list of things, right, then it's harder to remember. If you put it in a story, like the you know, words Arab said are feminine, it's just easier to remember, right? So he makes this amazing story and he tells it in class and everybody's like taking notes and one student raises his hand and says, so what color shirt does he wear every day? And the professor's just looking at him. Did you really just ask me this? And another student raises his hand. Yeah, I was, not, I was less curious about the shirt, but his socks really concern me. What, what kind of socks does he wear? And the professor is baffled. And he goes home, and he's so upset. And his wife asks him, what happened? And he says, you know that story I wrote? She goes, yeah, how'd it go? Well, I did a great job, but here are the questions that came forward. Can you believe what they were arguing about? How, how idiotic can they get? And Sheikh Ratib tells this story, and then he says, now read, سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةٌ رَابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ سَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمْ And I was like, oh. Allah is so offended by the stupidity of this argument that he records the whole thing. Can you believe what they're arguing about? What I just told you and what you're discussing? That's what I mean by asking the right questions. Allah wants you to think about certain things, but we want to think about all the things He doesn't want us to think about. What are the other brothers' names in the story of Yusuf? You know? Why? Why? Allah didn't tell you. What about his mom? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't read anything about his mom. I want to know about his mom. Yes. I'm sure you want to know about his mom. But Allah wants you to think about his dad. Can you just pay attention and just worry about the dad? If you want to worry about the mom, read the story of Musa. You can worry about the mom. But then you go, what about his dad? <laughs> is, that, is that clear? Like, ask, one, of the, one of the most beneficial things you'll learn in the study of Qur'an is what kinds of questions to ask, what to th how to think. Not every curiosity is healthy. You know, guy, the Qur'an it keeps asking you to think, think, think. His thought process gives you direction. Without thought process, you don't have direction. Your questions go in every direction. You know? And unfortunately, this is the unfortunate thing, you must maintain commitment to your thought process when you study Islam. You have to be committed. You know why? Because you're going to read a lot of books and you're going to read a lot of tafsirs where they're not committed to the same thought process. So there's going to be six pages on what color the dog was in the story of the cave in classical tafsir. And did he have spots or not? And what his name was? And you, it's going to be a classical text. And you're going to say, I'm reading the tafsir of Fulan, and Fulan ibn Fulan. 
I have ijaza in it. Yes, you do. That's great. You can read a lot of stuff, but you have to maintain your thought process. And you have to identify what's critical and what's not. You see? That's not going to be done for you, unfortunately. You have to develop that yourself. You know? And to me, the best way to develop it is commitment to Quran. Commitment to the primary text. The more you, you ponder over Quran, and you look at how Allah speaks and what He emphasizes, it just teaches you what to emphasize and what to let go of. What is priority and what isn't. Yeah. That's right. Allahumma inni asaluka ilman nafi'an. Anyhow.